Good evening and welcome to the second part of the lectures devoted to understanding React, uh, where uh, we'll uh, start uh, to dig into the uh, definition of how uh, the React components can be made alive, can be made dynamic, can, we can uh, uh, add the state uh, modifications and uh, or interact with the, all the forms, all the interactive elements in the page. Okay, so in the first part, uh, um, as we as we um, mentioned, uh, we uh, focused on designing the component tree and on passing properties. And uh, uh, today, on this second part, uh, uh, we are going uh, here to to deal with the life cycle of of, um, of React applications. So how components are created, how they evolve, how they render, the, how they uh, modify, and so on. Okay. So we may uh, start the second part of the journey uh, by analyzing a, a new topic uh, that may uh, be useful sometimes, uh, which is uh, uh, the so-called context uh, of uh, a React application. Context is a, uh, a quite recent addition to the React uh, library uh, that enable us uh, to simplify, in some cases, the propagation of properties. Hmm? Uh, avoiding the phenomenon that is so-called uh, uh, props drilling uh, uh, that happens uh, due to the combination of the two basic principles uh, of, of React. You can remember that uh, one basic principle of React is that components should be as much as possible functional in nature. Hmm? This means that components should only rely on the properties that you pass to them and maybe sometimes also on the state that, you have intern that they have internally. So uh, in order to change anything inside the component rendering, you must change the properties that it receives in input. Okay, and uh, uh, combined with the unidirectional information flow, it means that these properties can only come from the component above it. Hmm? And uh, so the only way to uh, modify the behavior of a component is having the container component, the one above it, the, the father, uh, pass a property. And uh, if this uh, father uh, already has is the source of this information, good, okay. But what happens is this uh, component it, it really doesn't have the, the, the information that the lower component needs. It means that this component should receive it from the f from its its father, and again its father, and so on. So it may be that we have a, a very high level component that has some information that it wants to pass to a component which is uh, five or six degrees down in the hierarchy. And it means that this property must be copied five or six times uh, across all the container components, all the nested components. Mm -hmm. So we need to drill through all the, uh, the, the layers of components in order to reach uh, the only one that really needs the information. All the others are just passing the value through without needing it in, for, for any other purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, they introduced the, the context API, which is a set of, 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 of functions and objects, uh, very, very small, uh, that offers us a, a, a solution to this problem by creating a global set of properties that can be automatically made available to all the components that need them in the lower subcomponents. Hmm? It's sort of such as teleporting, you can recognize the portal games where you, uh, you define something here and it uh, suddenly appears there uh, because it has been ported without needing to go through all the different layers. Hmm? Um, so this uh, uh, is a convenience uh, uh, library. Uh, it can be useful for some, uh, for some applications, of course, uh, not for all of them. Hmm? Uh, remember that here we use the word global and in computer science global uh, often is, uh, is associated with dangerous, uh, with something that is error prone that may create uh, subtle bugs uh, that we don't want to, to deal with. But uh, there are some cases in which uh, it makes sense to use this kind of mechanism. For example, imagine you, are, uh, you want to create a website that can be customized, for example, with the with a the visual team so the dark team versus the light team or the red versus blue or, or maybe also the language uh, can be different uh, in, in the website so you have you have an information which is very linear to the top of the hierarchy so the top of the page uh, it should contain some information about whether the whole app will be rendered in dark or, or light mode and 
basically every single component every single visual component every single div every single uh, button every single label every single image should know which css to use for example uh, which style to use which text color which back background color according to that property there but there are also a lot of other intermediate components uh, that uh, don't care about this information because they only maybe manage the logic of the application or the layout of the page or the containment of the of the objects and but they would be forced to get this information about the team and propagate it down to each and every child because who knows at the bottom of the tree maybe there's a span there's a div that really needs that information so this is an information this is originated at the top it is needed at the bottom and uh, in the middle is not used very, very much so this good uh, uh, candidate as uh, being a, a global context uh, for the whole page or for a big portion of the page uh, and another kind of information that um, shares the same properties is the uh, the um, login status hmm? you you have a website you have a login function the, in the top uh, uh, row of the page where you can log in or log out and the fact that you log in or log out will change a lot of other information on the website if you are logged out you are not presented with many menus or many items or many options um, in many websites if, if you're not logged in you actually cannot see anything uh, in the in the website while if you are logged in the structure of the whole page will change and so many components need to know whether the user is in a logged in state or not and if it's logged in, maybe many components along the page needs to know the name of the user, the image, the avatar of the user. Imagine a chat application where the, the, the avatar is shown besides every message, <coughs> but it's defined at the login level on top. So even here, we have something which is defined at the top of the page and uh, is needed in many or several components along the page. So it's something that is also a candidate uh, to be shared or uh, these are these were two um, visual examples but also data driven examples that may apply for example imagine you have an api hmm, for accessing a rest server and getting information and uh, uh, getting information from the rest api is costly of course it requires a network trip and uh, so maybe after you read something you may have a, a, a sort of a data cache some component that is able to store in its state uh, the results of the last uh, the last api call so this set of information, which is fresh data, which is immediately available, should be available to all the components that need it, uh, instead of uh, having to, again, drill down and pass it in all the cases. So these are some examples where this context applies. Uh, not every application benefits from, from the context, uh, and we should not force uh, its application uh, just because we know it, okay? But it depends. If, if we find this problem, then this is a solution. For um, reasoning with context, we have uh, basically three main ingredients. The first ingredient uh, is uh, the definition of the context itself. Uh, then we have a, a provider component and a consumer component. Uh, defini defining a new context uh, is basically uh, achieved by calling the create context method on the React object. And this will create a new object uh, of type uh, context. Mm -hmm. and we can give any name we want uh, to this object mm -hmm. so we are creating a new context and giving a name to that context by at, at this moment the context is not specific to any component it's not specific to any part of the page it, it doesn't specify even which kind of uh, information we want to store it's just a container that has been created somewhere and this container needs to be uh, filled at the provider level and need to be read or used at the consumer level and so we have two uh, new react components uh, that are created automatically one is called the example context dot provider so the name of the variable that we have here dot provider and the other one is dot consumer there are two different ways of consuming um, the, um, the properties the context properties uh, basically, uh, the provider uh, is used to store some value into the context container and the consumer is used to extract this information uh, and make it, make it available 
as a special property or as a function parameter to the component that, that will need them. Okay, so let's see uh, these um, ingredients in detail. So the first one was uh, uh, defining the context. As I said, it's quite easy. You just have to call the create context call and the function, and it will give you a new context object um, that uh, uh, is used to store some information. And basically, the context object uh, provides you two different components. So these are React components that you can use into the, um, in the, to the JSX syntax for wrapping other components. Hmm? Um, the, the container is able to contain uh, one object. Hmm? So like uh, this dot state contains one object, uh, also the, uh, the, the context will contain one object. Of course, uh, the object may be composed of many other sub-properties that may be objects or arrays uh, themselves. So this is not a limitation. Hmm? And, um, and what, what is important is the name that we give, the name of the variable, hmm, because the, the, that we give uh, to the newly created context container, because this variable will, uh, of course, uh, is the, be the one by which we are defining providers and consumers, so we need to export and import them into all the modules that need to access this name. Um, um, so the, all the components uh, may uh, consume hmm, these objects, uh, uh, this context, uh, and, uh, and so uh, use the value. And uh, the value pro provided is uh, the one provided by uh, a provider class. So actually, provider uh, stores a value and consumer reads that value. Hmm? Uh, what happens is if a consumer is not linked, uh, is not nested into any provider, well, in that case, uh, uh, the value return is the default value. Mm -hmm. But usually this, this default value is not used uh, practically never uh, because uh, um, normally the consumer will be nested inside the provider. So the consumer will find the information it needs uh, from a provider on top of the hierarchy. This is just a fail safe uh, if no provider uh, is being uh, defined hmm? um, but, but normally this default value is not something that you, will, you would rely on, on de in developing your application hmm? so this just creates the container doesn't not, doesn't do anything to your application uh, right now then we can uh, to store the information we need to um, instantiate a provider so instantiate a content a context provider component so the component itself is already defined when you create a new context and this component uh, uh, receives one just one prop which is called value and this value is can be set when you instantiate the component uh, to any uh, value that you want to any object that you want mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, content provider acts as a container container of all the DOM elements uh, uh, all the JSX elements uh, that are inside that uh, so every JSX element, every React element inside this provider may access to that value. Hmm? So a consumer, so a component that needs to access this value must be nested inside the provider. Hmm? This is a strong rule. So uh, if the provider is at the up level, the top level, then you can provide information to the whole application. But maybe you only want to provide a value to a given subtree, a given portion of your application. So you put the provider on top of the subtree of components that really need that kind of value. It may be a, a big subtree, uh, but doesn't need to be the whole page. So it's not really a global state. It's global to a group of the to a portion of the page. It's not local like a prop, but it's not really global. It's uh, constrained, uh, scoped by um, the provider uh, the providers may be anywhere hmm? and uh, we may also have different providers for the same context in different parts of the tree and they could have different values hmm? it doesn't it's not a problem so you may have uh, i don't know the left column uh, with providing the dark mode value and the right column providing the uh, the light uh, mode um, uh, team graphical team and they, because they are passing different arguments to their context, uh, to their context consumers down the, down the, the road, and, uh, and it works normally. Hmm? So just uh, each of them just cares about the properties being propagated to his own 
uh, subtree and we may also nest uh, providers uh, inside one another uh, this means that yeah, i have a provider providing a value to a subtree and then inside this subtree there is another provider for the same context with a different vi vi um, value of the value prop so in this case the innermost uh, uh, provider uh, overrides the outermost one so it's not an error to redefine a context value for a smaller set uh, of, uh, of, of elements hmm? which is also consistent with the functional nature of react uh, it's uh, if i have a self-contained group of elements uh, their behavior should not depend on anything outside hmm? so i'm defining everything i need here at this level so uh, nothing else from the outside may may affect what is inside these components hmm? um, and this value may be a statical value but most often is something that can be changed so from dark to light mode from logged in to logged out and so on and so whenever this value change all the components uh, that rely on the uh, on on these values so all the consumers uh, will of course re-render hmm? re render by and so they will re-render themselves with the new value of the context properties hmm? so it's a very simple mechanism I store your value here and i know that this value may affect every node below that wants to use this uh, value hmm? so they're not forced then they are not forced to use this value they need to declare that they want to use this value by declaring themselves as consumers hmm? so uh, being a consumer um, it may be may be done syntactically in two different ways one is valid for a function both function or class components and the other is only valid for class components so general the general case of tagging a component as a context consumer is uh, uh, wrapping the component is the in the consumer uh, component itself hmm? sorry for the repeating the word component so many times uh, this means that uh, inside your render tree you have a node which is the our context object uh, dot consumer mm -hmm. the consumer here and this means that uh, everything that is inside this tag uh, is expected to render uh, according to the current value of the context and uh, technically is implemented as a function as a callback function so this consumer expects to have a body of type function so here i declare that as an arrow function that takes the value and what is this value this value is the exact value that we, we stored into the provider so this consumer will seek for the, for the closest uh, provider up in the hierarchy of components when it finds that provider it reads the value that has been stored by that provider and uh, used it as a, a parameter of this uh, arrow function and here we can return or render some element tree that may depend on this value so every time we need to render a part of the tree that depends on the value we just uh, enclose it into the consumer tags and use a rendering function basically hmm? uh, this is valid always every time you in every place you have uh, um, some react element trees you can insert a tag like that so we can consume the uh, the value in many places whenever you need a part of this value mm -hmm. if this value was a very big object with many uh, properties you can only just use some of these properties here and some other there uh, there's nothing uh, uh, special for that there's another syntax uh, for uh, which is only valid for class components uh, uh, which uh, uh, is to add uh, a property called the context type to the class itself mm -hmm. so uh, in this in the first case is more of a, uh, using the context while you are creating the um, the component and in the other case uh, uh, you are uh, tagging the component by making a context available in the object itself so we are injecting into a component which should be declared with the class syntax uh, uh, we are injecting a copy of the context basically what we are doing is to store a property content type at the class level at the component class level and so we are linking uh, this class with this uh, uh, specific content context sorry 
and this uh, will automatically inject a property called the context inside the object um, and uh, you okay since it's a class property we can declare it outside the class or we can declare it uh, inside the class using the static keyword they are the two are equivalent in both cases declaring this content type uh, context type sorry there's a typo here context type is an x and not a t context type uh, should uh, uh, will um, add a new context property to the object instance and so we can use this variable this dot context freely inside our component in the rendering or in other methods in, a, in any other of the component methods so this is some way is more general because it, it makes the component uh, automatically a consumer and this consuming of the value may be um, maybe used in many times also in other methods that the class component may want to define so for example in event handlers uh, we should take into account of this context hmm? in the other case uh, uh, we can only use the value uh, of the context in rendering the component huh? but of course in uh, functions uh, in comp uh, component functions uh, um, there's no there's no other action that we can do other than rendering the component so it makes sense in this case okay um, so in this case we can consume a value which has been set uh, before and if we want to change it what can we do well change a context value is um, like changing a state actually the component doesn't really store the state uh, because you see that the, is the provider that is storing the value of some component and so the key is uh, intercepting the place where the provider is storing some some value in the context and uh, checking what is this value if the value i'm storing is a constant i cannot change it if the value i'm storing at the provider level is uh, a prop then I cannot change unless somebody else is, will change the property above me but the key is that uh, we can store into the, um, the provider the context provider uh, a state variable so in this case changing the state variable will automatically re-render the, the the provider which is a component after all and uh, will re-render it with a new value for the value property so in this case uh, uh, the state uh, is not in the provider is not in the context object the state is in the component that hosts the provider and uh, we just have to provide a callback function where we can um, change the state and if we want components down the tree so the consumers of the context to be able to change the context itself uh, then we should also insert into the context uh, the reference to the callback function that uh, will change the state variable. Hmm. Let's try to see an example. Uh, we, have, we have a simple example here where uh, we have a button hmm, at the bottom of the hierarchy here, a button class. And this button class is basically an HTML button here with the message that changes. Uh, the content of the message is a message uh, taken from the context hmm. uh, you, we are using the consumer syntax here the the functional syntax uh, where we are we are calling the consumer for the context ctx and uh, so we are looking upward in the hierarchy of who is instantiating this button whether we find a provider for the class the context ctx context if we when we find it we'll take the current value of the context and we use it for rendering this button and we'll extract extract from this context the property state message okay so let's we can can be any property here we, it doesn't need to be a sub property of state of course so if we go up uh, the button is, is a child of container container is here and uh, is uh, return is including a provider hmm? 
so this provider will then include the button as, a, as part of these children so the provider is inside the container class and we see that we, the provider is setting a value for the contact ctx hmm? so this context has been created somewhere outside the slide uh, with a simple react.create context call and the value we are passing is uh, uh, an object you see the double brace the first brace is for entering into javascript the second brace is for delimiting the object object with two components two properties state and update message state is actually the state of the container object you see there we initialize initialize the state variable with a message msg mm -hmm. i'm passing right now the whole state i may also pass just the um the, the some properties if i want hmm? there's no specific special limit or constraint here we are just passing an object uh, initialized with some values and we see that besides the state uh, we are also uh, sending a, a function update message this update message is a function that is stored into the context and we see that this function is used uh, on the on click event of this button we we'll see more the event later in this lecture uh, but basically when we click on this button this update message function is called uh, this update message you see is not here is not mentioned in in any property here it's just available thanks to the consumer just, just teleported these two properties state and, and update message at this location in the code and we see that the update message is nothing more than a set state find a callback that will call the set state to change the message so what happens here is that the the, uh, the button initially takes a value for this message which is hey message and once it's clicked uh, the context is changed well basically what happens is that is that we which we are changing the state here on which state the context is dependent so we are changing a state from which we are computing the current value of the context so changing the state of course changes this property from hey to who and calls the render method here calling the render will recreate a different provider because this value here this object here is changed and of course we'll re-render the container and then we we'll render the button and uh, in the in re-rendering the button we are calling this render method that will uh, seek uh, will activate this consumer that will seek the current value of the context values so this is the uh, the basic mechanism it takes a while to to see the connections you see that the, the strong connection here is the name of the context object ctx ctx and the value that we store there and this uh, uh, reliance of, on the value stores into an object is a key point in all the react framework uh, so once we we learn this uh, we just have to be aware uh, don't use the solution for every problem no this is not a solution for every problem uh, don't put everything into the context don't don't overuse the context uh, uh, api uh, because in some way it defeats uh, the purity and the functional behavior the idea of um, of react uh, because it makes a component less reusable so a, compo a consumer component imagine the consumer component relies on a given provider that should be above uh, uh, this component in the hierarchy and uh, so it means that we cannot reuse or move this component anywhere but only in some places where this context is provided and also the name of the context provider should be known and so it's another dependency so we are constraining a bit more the location in which the, pro the consumers may appear and um, don't use context just because you are lazy i know programmers are always lazy are always seeking shortcuts in their implementations but uh, when you need to only go through two or three or four layers of components to pass a prop maybe it's better to be explicit in passing the prop uh, instead of uh, instantiating a, a context that doesn't have real uh, um, the real meaning the real semantics of a context but it's just some uh, quick and dirty way to pass a value down okay and uh, being explicit with the property is also a, a good uh, uh, documentation practice so we should rely on that 
and uh, and again tr don't try to use the context to to propagate some information in a different place of the application because it will be difficult to prog propagate it otherwise hmm? in many cases uh, you need to rethink or refactor the the location of the state many times uh, before you find a good location for your state depending on the behavior of this of your components hmm? so uh, don't just say okay i'm putting everything on the top and uh, providing it with a context uh, because it will defeat all the component architecture uh really try to think whether your if you're if you think that you're you need really a lot of context providers maybe your state locations are not right and so you should lift up or down some states uh, or reorganize a bit the component tree uh, to find uh, better uh, better fitting solutions and also there are some uh, uh, other methods that can be used for uh, obtaining similar results uh, to what you could get with a context hmm? uh, for example uh, there's a quite powerful method in which you can pass uh, to a component uh, a property which is actually a function oh we are doing that every time but normally the, what you are passing down are event handlers or a callback function for changing the states but we could also pass down to a component uh, a function that will render the component itself hmm? so you can imagine maybe having a a button or an icon that should contain your name and uh, instead of propagating the name or providing the name as a as a, um, as a, as a context value uh, well you can maybe just pass send a function that will create the the icon with the name uh, uh, on the on the lower component so in some way i'm passing to the lower components a function that will be part of their render of their rendering uh, function hmm? so in one property we are not sending a set of data so that the lower component will be able to render itself but we are mm, sending just one prop which is a function that has the intelligence when it will be called at the lower level uh, to render itself it's a bit of the reverse that what we are doing normally with the uh, with react you normally in react we define the function at the top level uh, so that uh, lower levels can call the function to affect the behavior of the higher components but the same mechanism may be used in the same way uh, where function defined above may affect the rendering of the lower component by convention usually the we can uh, uh, call this property as a, a render prop hmm? uh, so we are called we are we can send a component defined in jsx which is just a function a set of objects or we can just set a, 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 a property called render we can call it as you want but by convention if you call it render is easier and then we can be called uh, at the bottom level hmm? so you can pass part of the component or a function to build part of the component this is just one item that you can pass through and this item will have all the variables uh, will close over all the variables that it needs uh, and that are available at the, at the higher level hmm. or another method is uh, for passing information so for having uh, the control by a top level component over the lower level component is manipulating the children uh, we already mentioned uh, we spend a couple more words uh, and slides or this con or these concepts we already mentioned that all the children of a given uh, node are available in a special property which it, that is called the props.children mm -hmm. uh, this children property may contain just a single element if uh, uh, like in this case the container only has one child and the article only has one child so it is just a single element or in general if you are uh, wrapping a, a list uh, for example a menu a list item a table then you will have a list of elements mm -hmm. uh, so when you're defining a component you maybe you are calling the container component and inside the component you are wrapping another custom component uh, right now you know in the example that we did every time we returned an, an, an element tree you see if you go and check you see that uh, in most of the cases the outer component was already a dom node 
something predefined we didn't have to manage children up to now hmm? because we just contain them into divs into tables uh, into headings uh, and then uh the the dynamic component we just at the bottom of the of the small element tree in this case we have a, a, a dynamic component here that contains another component so what the semantics here well just in the render of the container uh component on the of the external ones uh, one uh, where i can use the children which is a list that corresponds a list of a single element uh, that correspond to what is nested here in the JXX code. So this will be actually uh, this uh, rendering block uh, would actually take the article and wrap it into a class container. Mm -hmm. So we are changing the wrapping around the children. This is easy actually, but we can do more because this children is just a, a sort of a collection of the children elements that can be manipulated in some way. So we can manipulate the children by um, using, for example, a, a map that will change the behavior of each children. We can reconstruct the children. We can clone them. We can change their properties. Uh, the map is used to, to recreate a new array with the, um, by, modif by taking each one of the initial elements and uh, changing them. Mm -hmm. So we, in some way, we can manipulate the children inside the function of the of the um, of the parent hmm. uh, the children is not a real uh, a near a real array it's just a uh, data structure that supports the map and for each methods if you want to uh, apply all the other array methods uh, you can use two array and so at that point you can sort them and uh, you can do any sort of manipulation with the children hmm. Uh, there's much more to this uh, but uh, at the moment uh, let's just be happy with knowing that if a parent needs to modify the children, then uh, you, you should look the, for the documentation of the children um, object inside. So it's a special type of that structure, we adult children, that allows you to do any sort of uh, on, on manipulations on your children. Hmm? So this was just for uh, the moment, uh, the different ways where we can speed up the propagation of values or of behaviors of rendering behavior from top to bottom mm -hmm. um, now we can be a bit more specific uh, and see uh, what what else a component is doing other than rendering itself of course rendering itself is the key is the core of the react framework uh, but it's not the only function that we want to uh, to enable actually and so every component uh, has a specific uh, life cycle mm -hmm. which is called here um so uh, the the render method in the component is the most important one of course is the most important action and is the reason why the component is always updated you know, by call by calling render many many times but actually the life of a component uh, uh, is a as a cycle that will start when the component is born is first created with a, an operation which is called mounting hmm? uh, mounting is a process of different steps and it, uh, it's correspond to cre the creation of the component and the insertion of the component into the DOM. Well, to be precise, the insertion of the React elements uh, of the correspond or the DOM elements uh, corresponding to the virtual DOM defined by the React elements. But le let's make it short. We are inserting the component into the DOM, um, the real browser DOM. Uh, so we before doing anything with a component we must uh, render it and mount it for the first time into the real web page then the component is alive and it can be updated many many times every time a prop changes every time the state changes every time a provided context changes well this component needs to re-render also every time a f um, um, an, an enclosing component renders then this component will uh, decide whether it needs to render itself again. So inside this updating state, uh, uh, the component uh, will uh, be updated many, many times. Until, for some reason, the component is no longer needed, and so it needs to be um, unmounted. So in this case, the component is being removed from the DOM and will not be available anymore. Hmm? Each of these three stages, hmm, 
uh, as uh, is marked by different uh, step of, of or steps, um, sequence of, of, of operations of sequences of steps which are summarized in this picture here so when uh, the mounting process of a component uh, first uh, of course uh, we need to create the object and so as any javascript object we first call the constructor function so we execute the code inside the constructor then the component must render itself for the first time with the default value from the constructor and um, and then the react uh, will update will generate the virtual dom and update the dom and uh, and the reference we see later uh, what they are and uh, um, and finally the component will mount uh, into the um, the real dom the, the browser dom um, you see that the mounting component will come after rendering because before rendering we don't have any dom to mount uh, to, to, to inject into the, um, the, um, the browser itself the browser window itself uh, so this is the first step the second stage in updating is simpler because we have many reasons uh, why uh, the component needs to render itself maybe the props are changed or set state is called in this case the, uh, the render function will be called again and after the update uh, of the DOM uh, there is this uh, component did update event that will be triggered uh, these functions here like component did mount or component update uh, are usually empty they don't do anything but we can define them in our object if we want so we can define special actions to be executed at different points in the component lifecycle we can inside your our class component if you if we just define one of these functions they will be called at the appropriate moments uh, during the component lifecycle and finally also in the unmounting phase when the component is being disposed of before deleting it uh, with the com the, co the method component will amount uh, will be called if we define it in our component okay so these are components that are these are methods that are defined into the react component super class but they are not they don't do, don't do anything they are just empty if we want we can redefine them each of them at the component level we know that the render method must be redefined the constructor should be present but the other three are just optional and so in more detail uh, we know what the constructor should do the constructor should uh, uh, initialize the properties uh, with the super class uh, it should initialize the state uh, and of course since this is a initialization or better it's a, the creation of the state uh, we should just assign the state uh, with a, with the initial object mm -hmm. In the constructor we never call set state it's forbidden the state is not yet defined in the constructor we can only create an object that will then be uh, interpreted or used as a real estate variable by, by react mm. we can bind event handler methods mm. remember the binding of the event handlers uh, just to have the dix the this keyword hold the right value uh, if needed because if you are using just arrow functions you don't need the, the binding and uh, the constructor should never have any side effects mm -hmm. so it should be a pure function uh, that should not modify anything outside the binding of the, uh, the, the functions the local functions and the state mm -hmm. the only two modifications that we can do inside the constructor then we have render mm, that we don't spend more time talking about render because all the rest of the discussion is about rendering and this new component did mount component did mount is called immediately after the component is mounted so has been converted into the virtual dom and then merged into the real dom and in this case we know that the real dom nodes are existing so in some cases uh, maybe there are some initialization steps or operations that really require the knowledge of the real DOM nodes and so this operation cannot be done in render because render doesn't know the real DOM it can only be done in the component did mount method and uh, in particular there's one operation that usually goes into this component uh, did mount is uh, uh, the network loading uh, of data so if I need to load some information from a uh, an external server 
usually the place where i want to put this information is into the component in man where, where i launch the api calls i launch the fetch operations uh, here in the component did mount the constructor is too early hmm? i cannot mm, I, I, I should the state cannot be the state initialization cannot be deferred in constructor it should be synchronous here it's just an assignment in this component i call I, I may load some data and later on i can call set state when the data is available so i can um complete the loading of the component by doing some network calls that are asynchronous so these calls will only be launched when the component is really displayed on the screen and may call set state so the component amount will not cannot modify the state no other method than the constructor can modify directly the state but it may call set state in this case uh, set state will be will, will trigger another render method like we see in the picture here um, after the constructor the component is, is rendered and then we call component in mount and if uh, the component in mount calls uh, set state well when the state is updated you see we go into a, another update cycle so at the mounting of the component uh, we are often doing two updates in a row one with the uh, with, with an empty state or with a default value of the state and another with a real state what the react documentation says is that if you call set state immediately they call them immediately in the documentation then of course the virtual dom is updated twice but the real dom is only updated once so you won't see the flicker hmm? but mm, it, it remains to be seen what immediately really needs to really really means but this is a by large uh, the most important method uh, that we need to know component did mount uh, usually is all where asynchronous operations related to completing the state of a component are launched are started here the other methods are simpler are also less useful in a way the component did update uh, is something that uh, is called after any update so may, remember it will be called many times uh, uh, and be uh, be aware that uh, calling set state here is dangerous hmm? uh, you can call that is not forbidden but calling set state in this method will uh, force a rendering a new rendering yeah. but forcing a new rendering will again call component did update you see it here so something changes you render the component then component did update is executed inside here we are calling set state and so we are you see a set state call will trigger a new rendering and so we go into component update will trigger another set state and so on forever what we can say is that <clears throat> we can call set state but should be conditionally so not always maybe in some special case you want to have a second rendering because some condition has been changed <coughs> and so um it can be done but just be sure not to create any infinite loop when you call set state you should change the state in a way that the second uh, rendering will be the last one mm -hmm. otherwise you are rendering in, in a loop uh, and your component will never finish loading in the update uh, in the update method we we may also launch other network requests because maybe you need new data no? to be pulled in after a refresh but just remember that this method is called many times every time you call a render which is very often here this method will always be called so maybe we don't need really in all the rendering uh, to modify the dom so the rendering normally is fast because we, we don't modify many doms uh, in many nodes in the dom uh, but this function will be called anytime and so if you are if you are la launching a network call a fetch request uh, every time you render a component you are really really generating a lot of network requests so only do that uh, maybe when the proper changes just be sure to ask for remote data when you really need them hmm? um, the final method that we are considering is this component will amount uh, which is uh, actually executed just before uh, the component is destroyed hmm? amounted from the dom and then destroyed and this means that if you have uh, 
re uh, reserved any resources when creating the component we open any network connection <coughs> we sent asynchronous calls uh, and so on uh, this is a place of cleaning them up so freeing the resources that we are um, uh, we submitted to in the in the const in the um, component did mount so here we can uh, initialize or load data open connection and so on and in the amount uh, we should free those resources mm -hmm. of course uh, we don't call set state because it's useless because right after this component with this method will return the component will not exist anymore so there's no new state to re-render and uh, we know that the component uh, will not be mounted again once it's unmounted so this cycle uh, does not go back here mount update amount forever mm, destroyed forever maybe we will create uh, in some other place of the dom another component identical to this one but it will, be, it will be start from the beginning it will not be the continuation of the previous life or the previous component these are not all the methods there are some of them some methods are uh, that are less used are shown in this picture here and they are the one with the with the um, orange arrow uh, so there are other methods that can be uh, called uh, if you i will refer you to the, to the documentation to better understand uh, what these methods are doing um, uh, you could be forced to to look at two methods that force update and should component update and this method are give you more control over the um, rendering uh, of the of the component itself so uh, the, the bottom line that they put at the top because it's more visible is don't do this okay usually react is quite good at understanding when to render a component and understanding when the props are changed and so on so let's react decide when and what needs to be re-rendered okay if you really want to understand what these are doing force update is easy because you can call it anytime you called it so it's not an event tender it's an explicit method that you can call and will force a render of the component even if uh, the props are not changed and, uh, and the state has not changed and uh, uh, usually the re-render is, de is de determined automatically but uh, you may have some reason i don't know uh, to re-render a component uh, it, it only makes sense if the component depends from something else hmm? something other than the data the state and the properties what are these data i don't know maybe you are not following uh, correctly the uh, the functional paradigm if uh, a component is depending on some other information which is not declared in the state in the props and the context and should should component update is does the reverse it prevents an update of the component so maybe you're trying to be more clever than react and saying okay but in this specific in this special case this component doesn't need to re-render and none of his children also doesn't need to to re-render in this case you can define a should component update method that if the return false it will prevent the rendering of the component you see that this should component update is a, a sort of a barrier that may block the rendering operation but you should be really sure that this rendering would not change in any way the the web page so you are trying to do that for performance optimization but it may be dangerous because your interface might be out of date uh, if you forget to render something mm -hmm. if you have some uh, performance considerations you know, on components that are rendering too often uh, i suggest to have a look into the pure component which is a, a, a variant of component uh, that uh, allows a uh, um, uh, less uh, um, less demanding uh, from the computational point of view uh, reconciliation algorithm and the state detection algorithm so it will be faster to compare the current state with the new state and will render less often because it will only do a shallow comparison instead of a, of a deep one mm -hmm. but it's just if you are considering this for performance optimization you will probably have a very big and huge application and so you will need uh, this uh, on very specific cases but normally 
uh, you should be tempted to control the rendering the normal response or the basic the default uh, uh, answer is don't do that hmm? uh, other methods that are related in some way with the component life cycles are also the error handling methods hmm? uh, yeah components may also fail and so it's not the normal part of their life cycles to generate errors but may happen uh we are talking here at about errors during the rendering okay not during the uh, event handlers if something happens in an into an event handler it's your problem so you have to try and catch uh, your uh your exceptions and handle them uh, catch your promises and handle them and so on but the rendering process is not governed by our code it's governed by react and so react should give us a method uh, for handling some exceptions that may occur during the rendering phase. And uh, by default, uh, if you, as you, you saw that during the development of your exercises, for sure, that if you make a mistake, uh, uh, the browser will show an error page, at least in development mode. In production mode, this web page is not shown, of course, because it won't, it, we don't want to show our code with errors <laughs> to our customers. Um, but uh, uh, in development mode, it's shown to help you understand what went wrong. But if you want to uh, to catch an exception from your code and not just to see it in the debugger, uh, you can do that by creating a so-called error boundary. An error boundary is just a component. Any component may become an error boundary. So uh, a sort of a, a boundary, a container, where the error cannot propagate further. So the error will originate into some children component, some child component, and it will just propagate from the child towards the top until it finds a, an error boundary. The error boundary is able to manage in some way the error, and so will not propagate further. If it finds no error boundary, so if we don't do anything special, the error will pop up and propagate up to the application, and then will generate the error page. Okay. So, what transforms a normal component into a component with this error boundary uh, capability? Well, we just need to define one of these functions, or both, of course. Get derived state from error, or component did catch. They do, they serve different roles. Uh, there are more details, of course, at this link, so we'll uh, just see the, the basic information here um so uh, they are they have two different uh, roles mm -hmm. the get the right state from error which is a long name is uh, the method that tries to recover from the error by changing the state so of course uh, uh, the rendering may go may go wrong because some state is wrong it has some state combination values which are not consistent on something like that so we are receiving this method we receive a copy of the error that was thrown down the level and we return a value and this value is used to update the state so it's a sort of an implicit set state if i'm calling this i'm receiving an error i try to reconstruct a state object that will not generate the error anymore so we trigger a re-render <coughs> and uh, um, and uh, because we are changing the state uh, we hope to correct the issue so that the new rendering will render a different interface from the one that we were trying to render before but it generates an error uh, what happens if the if this change uh, this hope uh, is not uh, su successful so if we are changing the state but the error still occurs well the second time we'll get the error page but at least we have one chance of correcting an error. Hmm. Uh, it's part of the render phase, so imagine you are inside the rendering, so you are in a pure functional method. Which you, ca you cannot modify any properties anywhere, any other state. Uh, you just have to return a correct value of your current state, if you can. Uh, so this is uh, something for recovering or to let the, for letting the application continue even in the presence of the error. The other method, the component did catch, uh, catches an error that has been thrown by the sender component, uh, like, like before, and it gives you all the information about the error. 
uh, it doesn't change the state you cannot even call set state which is not be appropriate in this case and you cannot correct the error in any way so it's not for correcting the error basically it's for logging or for saving something um, so it's called during the commit phase so side effects are permitted so this means that this method is called after we try the rendering <coughs> after the error has been already decided and so you can take actions uh, after the error you see the the past tense here the component did catch already it already ca did did catch uh, an, an error and so uh there's nothing more to do except maybe logging the information uh, except maybe saving the state somewhere mm, into a persistent storage so that the application can be restarted maybe and you, we don't lose the data that we were working for so it's a sort of a saving outside or uh, storing the information um, that uh, was caused by this error that cannot be recovered in any way so actually it depends on our strategy hmm? if we try to recover the error from the error we can use the get derived state from error for trying to repair the state when it goes when it went wrong otherwise or after that if, if it fails we can also store some information that will help us to analyze and debug better the issue because we also have not just the error message but all the information about the stack trace all the function calls so we can store them so that we, we can uh, analyze them later to better understand what went wrong uh, so this uh, second part is a uh, more a debugging uh, uh, tool rather than an error catching uh, method okay so uh, unfortunately sometimes we have to also deal with errors uh, uh, in the rendering part the functional infrastructure of react makes it uh, very difficult to have strange errors so in many cases once you have the first rendering uh, all the errors are already pop up at the beginning otherwise the component will work and most of the errors will be in your procedural code not in the declarative uh, uh, rendering code hmm? uh, it's, it's much safer hmm? the, the, the functional part of react is much safer but in, sometimes it may happen hmm? and uh, so the, the strategy we recover or debug and you can have these uh, two methods available for that okay so i would uh, close the first part of the second lecture um, and uh, make a, a small break and in the second part uh, we will enter into the more uh, interactive part uh, of, uh, of the lecture where we um, see how forms uh, can be defined and handled in, uh, in the reactive ecosystem so let's see in a second